Hey there, folks. This is your host, Commissioner Zach Eichten, here with a quick programming announcement. Uh, I did not host this episode of The Rat Hole. Uh, that honor belongs to team owners John Stevens and Drew Mahold. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right. Welcome, folks. Uh, today we have myself and Drew Mahold. We're going to do a little... Uh, chatting back and forth about the draft, how it went last night on uh, Tuesday, see what we thought about everybody's uh, team, how they're looking going into the season, and uh, just how we feel about them overall. So, Drew, any uh, initial thoughts on how the draft went for yourself or just in general? Uh, it was interesting. Um, you know, the whole uh, how many picks were traded and things like that. Um, it was kind of nuts. Um just like trying to follow who was picking where and all that. But uh, no, I think it was, it was good. I'm excited about my team, uh, but uh, now we get to critique everybody else's team too. Yeah. I gotta say, I feel like, uh, I feel like pretty much everybody felt pretty damn good about their draft this year. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't hear many people, not that I don't know that people would really vocalize it, but didn't really hear too many people complaining about how their draft went. So I think we got some uh, confident owners and managers out there in the league. All right, mm -hmm. so uh, basically we're just going to run through each team one by one here. Uh, just going to talk a little bit about some of the, you know, favorite moves that we had, favorite picks that we had, least favorite pick that we had, and then just some overall thoughts on where we think uh, this team stands and having a chance to make a run at the title this year. Sound good? Sweet. Oh, yeah. All right, so uh, Drew, why don't you start us off with your thoughts on uh, Brennan Swan and the spring chickens? I love it. I love it. We'll start with Swan. Um so I'll be, I mean, right off the bat, I'm going to go with my least favorite pick because I hated it at the time. Uh, Rob Gronkowski, uh, extremely early to pick Rob Gronkowski. I thought um, guy who, uh, you know, can score touchdowns here and there, but he's never going to have a big fantasy day. Um, yeah. Now I know there were some tight ends that were already kind of running off the board at that point. And I think he kind of panicked and reached for Gronk there when he could have waited a little bit. So um, other than that, I love kind of having AJ Dillon as a kind of handcuff there option. Um, I also like his pick of the Washington defense. I think there's a lot of potential there, um, for the, the defensive side of the ball. So, um, I, you know, a lot of good things to like, again, I think the value could be had, um, with that, that Gronk pick. So, um, I mean, it's kind of like a solid, you know, B minus grade or so, um, so potential there, like the Waddle pick could be very interesting, but, um, overall nothing too uh, exciting there for Swan. Yeah, I would agree with you. I honestly, when I was looking through Brennan's picks, I wasn't really crazy about him. Crazy about him. I liked his handcuff picks, like AJ Dillon. Um, he got uh, Rashad Penny for like his actual own handcuff for Chris. Yeah, yep. I thought it was smart. Um, I didn't like the Gronk pick, like you mentioned. I also really didn't like the Michael Carter pick. Um, I think we kind of vocalized that in the draft room last night. Uh, a lot of people were really high on Michael Carter like a month ago saying like this guy's got like RB2, maybe RB1 potential is going to be a total workhorse. And then throughout the preseason, it seemed like he mm -hmm. was, you know, playing later in games when starters wouldn't be playing. Right. So um, I don't know. I don't think it's like terrible value in the fifth round. It's a rookie running back. It's a, you know, it's good to take a shot, but he was just kind of the rookie running back that I personally was staying away from. So I didn't love the pick overall. Um, but yeah, so Brennan's team in general, I'm just kind of like meh about it. I don't hate it. There's some players that I like, obviously Dalvin, um, but there's a lot that it's, I'm just kind of like, I don't really have much of a reaction to. It's pretty, uh, pretty middle of the road for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm kind of um, the same way there. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on then to uh, Thomas in the dog sniffers nice how are you feeling about thomas this year uh you know good and bad i think he kind of got screwed right with the whole deshaun watson thing um interesting he really went after quarterbacks uh which i like you know in, in a way he's got the guy for the future in lance he's got rogers he's got brady um, i was a big fan of chase edmonds that's my favorite pick of his um you know i, I think he could be really special for the cardinals this year so that's my favorite pick. Um, looking at the guys he maybe reached for, you know, I, I don't see anybody that jumps out at the page uh, per se. I think Debo may have been a bit high just because there's so much uncertainty with the Niners 
and the weapons that they use. But um, and of course, young way Koo, right? Uh, just sniping him in front of Lucas, who had three picks right after that. But uh, overall, I think, you know, given the circumstances, Thomas handled the draft pretty well. Yeah, I, I have very similar thoughts to you. I thought um, really just his first couple of rounds where he drafted three, uh, three of his first four picks were all running backs. I thought that was very good self-awareness from Thomas mm-hmm. to recognize that he really had a big need for running backs and he addressed it as early as he could and as often as he could. Um, yeah, I hate the young way Koo pick. Uh, obviously, he's a great kicker, but it's just a total betrayal to his good friend, Lucas. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I really just was sh- shocked when that pick came through. I I really didn't see that type of betrayal coming out of that friendship. Um, but overall, you know, I've been pretty low on Thomas's team ever since last year ended. Obviously, he's got Kelsey who can carry a team, um, but – I don't love his running back still, even after the draft, like he's pretty weak at running back and why yeah. he definitely strengthened up with the trade that he made with myself to get Allen Robinson. And he also has Keenan Allen, but other than that, he doesn't really have that great of wide receiver talent. So yeah, I mean, the, the, the depth is a concern, but um, if he gets some injury luck, Thomas could be right back in the thick of things this year. Cause the, that's a really good start at receiver. Those two guys, um, and then I think, you know, obviously when he's got Kelsey and Andrews as well at tight end, there's already a bunch of points had just that the ball, the, the pass catchers there. So definitely. All righty. Uh, speaking of young way coup, let's take it over to uh, Lucas Lawrenson. Mm-hmm. So obviously a, di- a little bit of a disadvantage right off the bat, just because of uh, the, the pick situation, but uh you know, made up for it nicely. I thought, um, knowing that he had a cut, uh, what I think are two really good starting backs with Barkley and Henderson. I think those guys are going to produce quite a bit. He kind of went after receiver then, um, in the draft, Jerry Judy, who I think could eat up nicely, um, with Teddy in there and that offense, Juju Smith Schuster, another guy who the Steelers throw the ball a ton. So there's some potential for production there. Um, and went and got a, a you know a couple of uh, a kind of a backup there for for Russ Wilson and a guy for the future in Burrow who there's a bunch of weapons there in Cincinnati and he could take off so um, and I like I like the fact too that he did get both of those Texans running backs and Lindsey and David Johnson that you know what you'd think one of them will emerge so I like that idea um, I don't really hate any of his picks to be honest I mean I don't see a a sort of a huge flaw there other than uh, well I guess. I what I would recommend in the in moving forward here is trade one of those Broncos receivers to Sam as soon as you can to get some value because Sam will overpay for him. Through that, yeah, I uh, I thought Lucas had a good draft considering how little draft capital he had going into this season. Um, I really like the fact that he picked both Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton. I'm kind of surprised that he was able to do that and space them out by like 15 or so picks. Mm-hmm. Um, so now he's basically guaranteed to have the top wide receiver in Denver, which I think, you know, it's kind of risky to draft either one of those guys, but when you get both of them, you're basically Mm -hmm. not taking a chance anymore. Um, the one pick that I didn't really love for Lucas was Gasecki just because he has George Kittle and because Lucas had so few picks, I just felt like he could, Yeah, I could see it, or maybe you could probably, if if Kittle does go down, you can almost just stream a guy and get, you know, Gasecki value. Exactly. Yeah. Um, at that point, but it's not like Kasiki has so much value that he could actually be a starter in his flex spot or really that great of a substitute if Kittle went down. So I agree. Like I felt like he could have just taken another running back or receiver there and then streamed a tight end if Kittle, God forbid, goes down, which hopefully doesn't happen again this season. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I thought Lucas did about as good as he could this. Mm-hmm. this yeah, draft, I think. pretty solid. He definitely improved his situation. You know, going in. Going into this offseason, it looked like Lucas was going to have one of the worst teams by far. Um, but coming out of the offseason and out of the draft, I think he's always to have a good chance to make the playoffs. So well done, Lucas. Mm-hmm. I agree. All righty. Then uh, I think we, maybe we can hop over to uh, the Sam Olson, the Bronco man himself, taking a Bronco in the first round. Not surprising at all. How did you uh, feel about the rest of Sam's draft? I mean, you know, I, I 
I think Javante Williams could be something. Uh, I, I think he could have waited a little bit to get him, where I think uh, other running backs such as Chase Edmonds, Damian Harris, um, either one of those Niners backs um, could have been uh, better picks at that spot. I think that's a bit of a reach, um, but I think he's, he kind of solidified it by, you know, he does have Kamara and Josh Jacobs. He also handcuffed Jacobs with Kenyon Drake, which I thought was a really good pick. Um, and then he addressed some, got some young receivers as well to kind of build on with both Devonte Smith and Michael Pittman. So um, pretty solid overall. I, I think the Drake pick is my favorite um, just again, based on he and Jacobs there. Obviously there's going to be some, um, fighting for carries there, but I think once that's figured out, he could have a nice option there for an offense that will score a lot. So, um, pretty good overall by, by Sam. I think, um, I have no qualms with really anything else besides maybe reaching a bit for Javante Williams, but of course that could be, I could be proven wrong there. Yeah. I had the exact same thought process. I thought, you know, Javante Williams, I, I think it is smart for pretty much every team to draft a rookie running back. I just am not sure that's because yeah, you never really know which guy's going to pop right away. Um, you know, with what offense necessarily, but it just seems like he could have, you know, made a pick there at 1.9 and then waited like for 3.7 perhaps to get that guy, for example. Yeah. I think he for sure could have gotten him with his second round pick. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, and, but speaking of his second round pick, I actually thought it was Sam's best pick in the draft. He took, uh, who did he take? He took DJ Moore. Mm -hmm. I was honestly surprised to see slip that far. I think technically based on what our draft board looked like, once the keepers were filtered in there, DJ Moore should have certainly been a first round talent. You know, I think a lot of teams obviously prioritized running backs and tight ends because that was a need that they had. And DJ Moore slipped all the way to the last pick in the second round. And mm -hmm. I thought that was a very good pick value wise from Sam. So mm -hmm. um, especially because Sam, even though it looked like was going to have a phenomenal wide receiver, you know, situation going into the season after trading, Amari Cooper kind of suddenly T Higgins was like his second wide receiver that he kept. So I definitely felt that Sam could strengthen up that wide receiver course. So yeah, for sure. I, I think more is a more is kind of got a, he's going to get the targets, right? Um, there's, there's not a lot of bust potential there. I feel like he might not be a superstar, but he'll get enough yep. production, I think to, to, you know, satisfy the wide receiver three need for a team. Yeah. I mean, my only concern with DJ Moore is just, I'm personally really high on Robbie Anderson yeah, yeah. Because he's not that he had that much success with Sam Darnold, but he is reuniting with Sam Darnold. That's right. Mm -hmm. I never think I, I never thought of that the dynamic there. So that's a good point. Yeah. So we'll see. But yeah, I think overall, you know, Sam's team again, this is kind of another team that's like middle of the pack. I'm not yeah. necessarily crazy about his team, but he obviously has some good players. I think it's really going to be highly dependent on Camara's performance. Yeah. That's and I've been I've been vocal about where I think Kamara is. I think he's going to drop off significantly. But if he is able to maintain that kind of elite production, then Sam might have a you know uh, kind of a, a contender status on him here. Yep, for sure. All right, let's hop over to uh, the man with the most capital going into this draft, Tony Townsend, who had a ton of picks early on. Drew, you may have uh, actually finished your draft slightly earlier with that sweep of uh, <laughs> round picks, but Tony had, I think he at one point said like he had like seven picks in the first three rounds or two rounds or something crazy like that. So, yeah. So uh, it was, to, it was almost tough to follow, but he had, so I hate the Tyler Lockett pick. I'll just say that just because, and I'm a little bit biased and scarred yep. by what happened last year. So I get that, but he does have that, that boom potential that, you know, and when you have already, Diggs and Jefferson on your team. It's fair to kind of go for that guy. Uh, I think Harris was the kind of easy number one pick. Um, I will say though, and I think I'd love to hear his thoughts on this, but I wonder if he was going for pits before the whole JK Dobbins thing. Um, Cause it seems like he would have been pretty solidified at running back at the time. And then he could have slid Kyle Pitts in right there at tight end. Um, anyway, that's, you know, I, you can't go wrong with Harris there. I don't think. Um, I think Lockett's again, major reach. I think Callaway could be a nice piece there, especially if Thomas and this whole injury thing takes a little bit longer at the saints. I think Callaway could be, uh, a fantasy machine. Um, if Jameis kind of, you know, is his, himself right and throws a ton of downfield balls that 
are high risk, high reward. So that's a kind of a sleeper pick that I think could be pretty productive. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was I was also not a big fan of the Lockett pick. Um, but personally, the pick that really stuck out to me as being the worst one was Matthew Safford in the second mm-hmm. round. That um, too, yeah. I think like after Herbert and Rogers, there was a massive drop off in QB talent. Um, and he took him with the second pick and then the next quarterback didn't go off the board until the fifth round. So he, yeah. And it's, it's just one of those where he kind of sensed that the quarterbacks went off the board. Oh, I got to get one right now. Cause they're going to be gone. Panicked. Uh, it happens all the time. Fantasy draft or real draft in the NFL draft. But um, yep. you look back at the board and you're like, yeah, I probably could. He probably could have waited on, on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, it sounds stupid, but I really do feel like the Harris pick was, t- you know, it was Tony's best pick, a very similar to Clyde last year where, he was the very obvious first pick, you know, a month ago, Tony was, I know, strongly considering trading that pick because he really didn't need a running back because he had three solid keepers, but Dobbins goes down and now he takes Najee Harris, who's mm-hmm. the obvious value pick in our first first pick of our draft, which is theoretically the 55th, 51st pick in the draft. So he's getting them um, like way later than he should oh, be yeah. in a normal draft. So great value um obvious so it's hard to give a ton of credit but i did think you know he made the right choice there right trading back or mm-hmm. taking hits instead so all righty um speaking of pits let's uh let's talk about the old nulsif yeah so this Man, how about this draft board i mean there's like you know pick two pick what 11 and 12 and then nothing in the next 40 like four picks or something like that. Yep. Uh, I, I mean, Pitt's good pick. Uh, I think he can be really something with the Falcons there being that Jones is gone. Somebody else is going to step up as that next receiving weapon. Um, I, I like Herbert as a fantasy quarterback guys, a stud. They're going to throw a lot with the chargers. That's a good solid selection there after giving away or I'll trading away Dak last year. Um, Kareem hunt. I know I had kind of had him last year and dealt with the whole, Oh, I hope for fantasy's sake that that Chubb gets hurt and he never really did. Um, there was maybe a game or two where Hunt started, but it wasn't really producing like kind of that RB1 level of play. So, I mean, it's obviously the nice handcuff to have. I think maybe a bit high in the draft to reach for that type of a pick. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. Noel's got the, the starting running back talent already, obviously, with McCaffrey, Taylor, and Mixon. So he doesn't really need to go for a guy that's going to produce right away. Um, I do think Curtis Samuel's got some potential there in um, Carolina, but other, I mean, I don't think the rest of his picks are particularly special. Of course we could be looking back at this um, later on. And then fields, I think is a nice stash play. Um, eventually the bears got to play the guy. So uh, a good stash play and potentially moving into next year. If you got a, a keeper play there, he could be one of them. Yeah. You know, you mentioned hunt and not, loving it and thinking it's a bit of a reach. I actually love the hunt pick and it's not because of this season. It's because of the potential of him going to a different team. Yeah, that's true. Contract expires. I think like you mentioned, Noel is obviously very strong with three very good running backs on his team already. So I think it's, it's a total stash play for next season. Um, And as long as Kareem hunt goes to like one of 27 teams in the NFL, he's going to be the starter and probably a keeper in this league. So as long as Kareem Hunt plays as well as he did in the last couple of years, signs a big deal in the offseason and stays healthy, I think he's an obvious keeper uh, in this league. So mm-hmm. either Noel will be able to get some tremendous value from trading him or keep him in, keep him himself. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, Noel, like you said, he didn't really have that many picks. The only pick that I didn't really love was Johnny Smith. Yeah, yeah. And that, looking back at it too, like there's no reason to get another tight end, I don't think. I mean, yeah. there's kind of no like reason to draft another one. Things. It's kind of, yeah, the same thing. Like you have your stud tight end. You don't really need another one, I don't think. I mean, yeah. you can probably just, I mean, if, if you're going to get that same kind of quality player if you just pick a guy up each week on free agency. Yeah, and I mean, you know, with the lack of picks that, Noel had his team is very top heavy. He doesn't have a ton of depth. So right. I think I just would have probably taken another wide receiver. Just, I mean, I know that the wide receivers taken, you know, this late in the draft are typically dropped and picked up repeatedly over the course of the season. So it's not like you're picking from an unbelievable pool of talent in the 10th round, but you know, maybe like Marquez or Callaway or somebody like that, he mm-hmm. might've had the opportunity to take and, 
I don't know. It, you know, overall, I I still really like Knoll's team, just like I did last year. I think he's yeah. definitely got one of the strongest rosters in the league, and think he's definitely going to make some noise this season, as long as his players stay healthy. So hopefully that, you know, hopefully he's got mm-hmm. health down inside this season. So, all righty, let's uh, let's hop over to uh, your team, Drew. How are you feeling about your draft this season? Yeah, well, in my unbiased opinion, I killed this draft. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I kind of had a little bit of an Ole B.C. Johnson moment here. Um, and what I mean by that is I took Hubbard uh, set kind of <laughs> very early. Uh, I just I got I had three picks in a row. I went a bunch of handcuffs with Connor Pollard and Hubbard. And then Hubbard was the guy I realized, like, why do I have him right now? So I cut him immediately. So uh, looking back, don't like that. But I think I got good value with Tanyan um, at tight end. He was on my team a little bit last year and contributed nicely for me. Um, I think Odell could be a sneaky good pick in that, you know, he's my fourth receiver and he's still that super talented guy that could get a bunch of targets in production. So could be a nice trade piece for me moving forward. Um, and then of course I've kind of made my, said my piece on, on Gus Edwards. I think he's going to be really nice with, with no Dobbins there. And I don't, I mean, I, don't, I really don't think Le'Veon Bell's a, a threat to him or his playing time. Um, if anybody, it's it's that Tyson uh, Johnson, I believe, the guy that they drafted this year. Mm-hmm. But um, I really think Gus will get a ton of carries. With and then that right, that Ravens rushing attack is is awesome. So I'm really excited about Gus. Yeah, I um I really like the Gus pick as well. Um, I didn't think he'd fall to the eighth pick, actually, to be honest. I didn't either. I know that he was obviously projected much later, just because of all the drafts that had already happened. His yeah. draft pick was much lower than where he should be picked based on when we drafted. Um, but yeah, I was kind of surprised he made it that far. I love the Odell Beckham pick. I pretty sure I gave you a thumbs up for that one. When I saw him go off the board, um, I was honestly shocked that he made it that far. I thought for sure he'd go in the early part of the second round, even though he's coming off an injury last season before he got injured, he definitely showed like the ability to still be an explosive wide receiver in a very explosive offense. It might be kind of run heavy at times, but Baker's a very solid quarterback and they got a lot of weapons. So he seems like the obvious number one out there in Cleveland. So I really mm-hmm. like that pick. And like you said, you're already very strong at wide receiver, adding a guy like that as someone who's most likely going to be on your bench most of the season, I think is a good pick to be able to plug in on those bye weeks or possibly mm-hmm. trade him. Um, I, there wasn't a pick that I didn't like. It was more about what you didn't do with your six round picks. And that was not drafting cam Akers. And I think you realized. Yep. Oh, I realized that. Yeah. I totally board. realized that. Cause it was one of those where you get locked in on like, who are the top guys available on the board, things like that. And I mean, it's just, that's on me for not preparing well enough and not even, you know, cakers of all should have been on my board higher yeah. than that. So um, that's certainly a mistake. And I hope I don't regret it too much. Yeah. I, <laughs> you know, like, there were a few things that I was certain about in this draft. Um, but one of the things I was pretty damn certain about was Drew Mahold taking Cam Akers in the sixth round, just because of how many picks you had there. Obviously him being on your team and having the disappointment of him getting mm-hmm. injured before the season even started, I thought for sure you'd want to, you know, stash him for, potentially for next season, knowing what he can do when he is on the field. But yeah, you know, hindsight is one. So yep. who knows, maybe with how much we trade in this league, he'll come back on my roster at some point. <laughs> All righty. Um, let's hop over then to uh, the commissioner himself, Zach Eichton. Oh, yeah. Mr. Eichton himself. Uh, so a lot of his players are actually from me. <laughs> you got Eckler, Eckler, Montgomery, uh, Josh Allen, of course, who just uh, daggered me last year in the championship game. So I, I think you'll agree with me that we're kind of moving over to the Cakers pick here. That's the big value potentially in that eighth round uh, next year. Um, I think Gaston could be a nice serviceable running back to have as a backup. Uh, I like Logan Thomas a lot. I was debating between Thomas and Tanyan with that tight end pick that I had right before. Uh, so either one I would have been happy with. I think Thomas could be really special with Ryan Fitzpatrick, who does sling it around quite a bit. Um, I think he could be a nice value there. I think that's probably my favorite pick here. Um, Michael Gallup, I think, could also be something that um, – you know, with, with Dallas, uh, they're with Dak coming back and all these pieces healthy again, that offense could spark right away and Gallup could be, could see some nice production as a result of that. Um, the Le'Veon Bell pick is completely worthless to me. And obviously in the 10th round, pretty much all of it's worthless, but, uh, the guys on the practice squad. So 
Um, won't see a lot out of that, but um, also the Brandon Cooks pick. Um, I don't really know what Houston's going to do for passing the ball. So that's another one that I don't think you'll see a lot of production out of there. Yep. Yeah, I you know overall I really liked uh, Zach's draft. I thought he did uh, did a very good job. Uh, the pick that I liked the most was his third round pick of Sermon out in uh, San Francisco. Like I had mentioned earlier, I think every team at some point should take a rookie running back. I think that Zach kind of hit the sweet spot with not taking one too early when he could have taken a guy that was more of a guaranteed thing. Third round, you're kind of getting to the point where, like, you don't know if these players are really going to pan out or not. So I think it's a good time to take a shot on a rookie running back in a system that is very heavy into the run game. But you never know with San Francisco who's going to really be that top guy. I think a large part of that is because Mm -hmm. they haven't had a guy that's really separated himself uh, in the running back room. But I think Sermon could be that guy. And like I said, I think it was just a good good time in the draft for him to make that pick. So I thought that was a really good pick. Uh, The pick I liked the least wasn't necessarily because of the player, but who he could have taken. It was another running back. He took Gaskin with a second pick. I just really thought that should have been Edwards. I thought between Gaskin and Edwards, to me, it's an obvious pick to go with Gus Edwards just because he's going to have way more volume than uh, Miles Gaskin. I don't know. The reports have been so conflicting about Gaskin. One week they're saying that it's going to be a committee. The next week they're saying he's the feature back, so... I just thought Edwards would have been the safer pick there. Um, but regardless, Gaskin still should be a viable option, like you said. Mm-hmm. Not a, I mean, it's not a bad spot to have him. I just think Edwards, he's been over, he's averaged over five yards to carry in each of his last yeah. three seasons. Um, and they get only more volume this year in that Ravens offense. So, and the, the Dolphins offense, not super spectacular. So, um, Tua. but I mean, ha- I guess, hey, maybe Tua mm-hmm. takes that next step. Yep. All right, uh, two more teams here. Let's go with uh, Josh Polingo. Yeah, Mr. Polingo himself. Uh, I think this might be the the draft board that was kind of most in line with like where they originally started. <laughs> yeah. um, but you have Cooper Cup, who a complete wild card, uh, at least in when I've had him on my team. Uh, I know he's part of one of my terrible trades in the past where I kind of gave up quite a, quite a bit of value. Um, the Mike Davis thing is interesting. Uh, I think he could be a really nice piece there. Um, I don't know if he's an RB three material, uh, but I think, you know, last year it was, a, it was uh Falcons running back again that he acquired right after the draft with Gurley. Um, that didn't work out super well. Uh, I'm going to go back to Robbie Anderson. Uh, John, when you mentioned about the connection with Darnold, I think that's my favorite pick that he made. And then also the Nicole Hardman pick, just in the sense that the chiefs, are such a high powered offense that there is going to be touchdowns and yards out there to be had. Um, and Hardman's going to, at some point, he's going to be a recipient of that. He might be the third or fourth option, but that's still going to be a good value in the seventh round on the chiefs offense. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree with the Robbie Anderson pick. Like we've already said, um, having that connection already established with Sam Darnold, Robbie Anderson has also been, you know, very, dependent on yardage for his scoring, which is kind of what you want out of a receiver. You want them getting points from their yardage and from their receptions in a PPR league. You don't want them to depend on touchdowns. And I think only four touchdowns for Robbie Anderson last year. So if he can just have like a little bit of an increase to his touchdown numbers going Mm -hmm. into this season, I think he immediately jumps into that, you know, RB2 category. So it'll be interesting to see Getting back with Sam Darnold, if he can make that next, you know, next step and kind of mm-hmm. overtake DJ Moore as the number one guy. Um, I I don't love the Mike Davis pick, but I'm even a less fan of the Noah Fant pick personally. I think that pick kind of just got timed. Not it wasn't the best timing on the pick, just because I felt like there's a pretty big drop off after Pitts and Hawkinson. I don't really feel like Fant is that much better than Tanya and or Logan Thomas, so I thought to like take him in the second round when all those other tight ends ended up sliding all the way to the fourth round was a bit early, a bit of a stretch, but maybe he knows something about uh, no Mm -hmm. that I don't. So we'll see how that one pans out for him. All right. That takes us to our final team, which is uh, myself. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and uh, roast me, Drew. (laughs) Well, uh, so I, I, the way that your team was constructed, I think you had to kind of go in and get a receiver that had a solid floor that would give you points as a wide receiver to each week. I think Deontay does that. Um, 
where you can now pair him next to Devontae and you know he's going to get that seven or eight catches when he's healthy. Might not be for a ton of yardage, but you know he's going to put up near double-digit points just because of that. Um, so that's nice to have, and I like that pick in that way. Thomas is risky but uh, at your, with your second pick, but again, I think the fact that you are such a top-heavy roster already, you have so much potential there, uh, plus you already have Waller tight end, so you can kind of make that risky pick a little bit. Um, same with Antonio Brown in that same, oh, and Kenny Galladay too. They're all kind of that sort of high ceiling, but potentially low four type of pick, which I think is a strategy that you were able to employ based on how talented your keepers are. Um, other than that, you know, I, I think Gage could be another wild card where the Falcons do put up a bunch of passing yards, could be Pitts, could be Gage, who's sort of the, the number two behind Ridley there. Um, I think one of them is going to be at another kind of risk there. And then, I, hey, you, you got the best kicker from last year, Sanders. So, uh, you know, I think you you employed it. Your strategy was, well, yeah. <laughs> I think your strategy was unique in that with so with how good your keepers are, you could be a little bit more risky with your picks. And I think you did that really well. Yeah, no, I, I you nailed it. That was totally my strategy was, you know, I definitely knew I needed to get a receiver early that was going to be just solid because I didn't have a wide receiver too. Um I am so like up in the air. Like, I don't know if I like the Deontay Johnson pick or not. I like the Deontay Johnson pick because it allowed me to also take Michael Thomas, um, who I can now stash away. And hopefully if he mm-hmm. comes back and is any resemblance of himself, he will definitely be a starter on my team once he's healthy. One thing I'll also say this on Thomas, I do think it's at least a little bit possible that he's traded before the trade deadline to a different team. Yeah. And I would which, not mind that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think that would benefit him. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, I like the Deontay Johnson pick from that aspect. The only reason I don't like it is because I told myself that if Kareem hunt got to where I was in the draft, I was going to take him, And I basically mm-hmm. didn't have the balls to do it. Um, I will say I would, I would bet that you, I mean, I, I would see hindsight as one, but I think you would have got Deontay at two five if you really wanted to. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. And as soon as I did it, I was like, man, I really hope that hunt makes it to five (laughs) with the next pick. So, you know, I, it would have been nice to have him as a handcuff for Chubb, but I was really thinking about the value going into next season. Um, and knowing that I had like strong teams already, I knew I didn't like necessarily need a guy who was going to play right now. So Mm -hmm. like I said, kind of up in the air about the Deontay Johnson pick, um, just for those kind of like cascading, uh, yeah. consequences. Uh, the pick that I like the most for my team is Damian Harris. Um, I really just thought it was kind of surprising to me that he fell that far. I definitely wouldn't have taken Raheem Mostert or Mike Davis or Chase Edmonds over him. I just think that Damian Harris is much more talented. He's younger than those guys. He's finally mm-hmm. not having to compete with like another Sony with Sony Michelle, who's kind of always been parallel to him. So now he's going to be like, yeah, that's a good point. The main first and second down back. And then obviously James white will probably still take the uh, pass catching downs. But I think like, he's a good player for me to just have on my bench in case I do have injury issues. I think he has a relatively high floor. So I was mm-hmm. really happy with, uh, with him sliding that far and me being able to take him. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think you executed your strategy probably the best. Like, obviously, I don't think it's all encompassing the best, but I think the way that you had to go about things was obviously much different than like Lucas or Thomas or, I mean, Tony, even with his abundance of picks, like all the strategies were so different, which was in a way kind of made this really fun. And even like Noel, too, Mm -hmm. who had like six picks. But um, I think you executed that really well. I think Josh really bolstered his team well, too, actually, um, looking at. Robbie Anderson and Hardman knowing that he had to get some receiver depth. So, I mean, it's, it's fun. We're here. We're here. It's football season now. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think, um, you know, looking in preparation for this, I was actually pretty surprised at just the parody in our league. I think that really pretty much, I'm surprised to say this. I really do feel like any team could be, any team in week one of this season, like with all of our teams fully healthy, basically going into the season, I think that the Lucases and Thomases of the worlds could very easily win their week one matchup. Um, and I think that, you know, myself or Noel or some of the other stronger teams like yourself, Drew or Zach or Josh, those teams could very easily also fall. Like, I really feel like 
we have a pretty level playing field going into this season. And it, that's not something that I felt, you know, two or three weeks ago, looking at everyone's keepers. So I think everyone did a very good job of like addressing the needs that they had on their own team. Right. Which uh, it's, it is funny just how the strategy changes completely, like based on draft capital. And I also was, I had fun watching uh, like handcuffs be a priority for teams. And I didn't look, I didn't realize how much it happened until I went back and looked at the board and you saw, you know, Sam with Kenyon Drake, or, I mean, I know I was all over the handcuffs um, with my own team. So it's uh, yeah. I mean, that's it, fun to, to watch that unfold. Yeah. I think last year certainly served as a uh, stark warning to what can happen when you don't have handcuffs for some of your, you know, most important running backs or most important players with, just how many guys got injured or out with COVID last season. So I think a uh, good adjustment made by the, uh, the managers in this league for sure. But uh, yeah, that basically wraps up our uh, draft analysis. Um, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me, Drew. Absolutely. It was a good time. Good luck to all the participants in the league. Uh, you'll be chasing me all year. All right, Zach cut. I know Zach's just going to include this part anyway, probably, but. Hopefully he cuts. All right. Welcome to the week one matchup previews for the Punk Rose Fantasy Football League. Um, uh, I am Drew Mahold, team owner, Screw Some Grinders, 2021 runner up, excuse me, 2020 runner up, 2021 champion, uh, and the moderator of the uh, commissioner debate this year. I uh, have John Stevens with me. Uh, team owner of the uh, was it lock plopses now yeah yeah the lock plopses. The same. uh you know some will call some will remember the iconic moment in the pick em se- segment last year when i made that incredible pun that's right that's right mm-hmm. um so i thought you know it's a funny pun uh, are you locking yourself as a champion is that what this is uh, that might be what i'm implying we'll see all right. There's definitely Fair some enough. confidence on my side. So I thought, you know, the nickname kind of suited how I was feeling about my team's chances this year. So. All right. Um, fair enough. Fair enough. And I think, do think your team is, is pretty, pretty loaded to begin the year. So potentially a favorite to win, but um, let's get into some of these matchups here. We'll start with, I'm going to go with the spring chickens and the, the Jacks on Jacks off. A couple uh, unique team names there. Um, so that's Brennan Swan versus Josh Polingo. Give me your take. Who wins? Yeah, well, first of all, I do not know what to think about uh, Josh's name, his team name. It might be the most stereotypical Josh Polingo fantasy football name of all time, making a yeah. jacking off pun when he has uh, Lamar Jackson on his team. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, I I definitely struggled with this one going into this week. Uh, I completely forgot who I picked in the pick so I'm probably going to contradict myself. But uh, uh, I really like Dalvin Cook going up against Cincinnati this week, so that's a good matchup for, uh, for Brennan. Uh, on the other side of things, Zeke is going up against a really good Tampa Bay defense, so I think, you know, that – running back matchup alone leads me to lean towards Brennan this week, just because those two guys are so uh, important to these teams. So I'm going to, I'm going to favor Brennan in this matchup. I got Polingo. Um, I think he, I think first of all, I like Lamar is going to just tee off on the Raiders. Um, And I'm excited about his, his kind of combination of AJ Brown and Terry McLaurin. I think, you know, outside of, um, you know, like, Zeke and, and James Robinson at running back, but I think AJ Brown and McLaurin are going to be huge this year. I think they have decent matchups to start the year. I'm going to go with uh, Jackson, Jacks off yeah, <laughs> to win that one. That is an incredible wide receiver duo that Josh has. That's for sure. That could be very potent for him going into the season. So matchup two, we've got the dog Sniffaz. He did change the name a little bit, so we got to make sure we account for that in pronunciation. Uh, the dog Sniffaz. And uh, imposters uh, in this matchup. That is Thomas versus Lucas. Uh, who do you got? Yeah, you know, another pretty evenly matched, uh, pretty even matchup this week for these two teams. I, I don't know. I got this weird feeling that 
as long as Saquon plays, he's just going to go absolutely crazy this week. Like, I think he might have like four touchdowns and like 180 yards or something absolutely crazy. Um, so for that reason, I think I'm going to favor uh, duh imposters. Uh, sorry, Thomas, but I just – there's too much sunk cost, as stated by Lucas's nickname for Saquon. I think he's finally going to pay off. I, I hope so, just for the sake of uh, – justice <laughs> like finally Barkley plays um I like I like Lucas's core here though a lot um I'm gonna pick him this week Ross Wilson again early season Russell Wilson a uh, big fantasy scorer True. uh Saquon Barkley Adam Thielen um George Kittle against the Lions that sounds like 30 points so um I like Lucas this week uh moving on to we've got kind of a fun match up here uh the lock plops does John's team uh, against Rip Dobbins, Tony Townsend, um, wearing it on his sleeve, uh, wearing it like armor. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very confidently picking the lock plops this year. I'm going to lock them if you will. Um, uh, and there's just that roster is just incredibly loaded. And I, I just, while there is some star power on Tony's side at receiver in particular, I don't think it's going to be able to be enough to keep up. Yeah. I like myself this week. Um, I'm very, very excited to see what Jalen Hurts is going to do this season. So that is definitely the thing I'm watching the most on my team this week. Obviously, I took him, I think, like in the fifth round in the draft this year. So I feel I feel like I kind of went for the Lamar Jackson pick of quarterback this year. In his second year, only played a few games in his first year, but showed signs of uh, potential to be a fantastic fantasy option. So I'm really interested to see what Jalen's mm-hmm. able to especially against Atlanta, who's historically a horrid team against the pass. So I guess I don't really know how they stand this season in terms of their secondary, but definitely going to be paying close attention to uh, my man, Jalen, Jalen healths. Nice. Nice. Uh, All right. Fourth matchup. I've got Knowles, Randy donuts, Sam's Google team names. Um, That's uh, what do you think there in that matchup? I know I'm, Personally, no. I'm very confident who's winning this matchup. Oh, really? Yes. I, uh, you know, I think to me, everything points at Randy's Donuts winning this week. You know, Christian McCaffrey, I'm just absolutely terrified to see him back in the league. He's probably going to be dropping 25 to 35 points every single week. So obviously that's a huge advantage for, uh, for, null every single week but i think this is the one week where he is kind of matched on the other side with a guy that has that potential in alvin camara even though i'm not the highest on camara obviously camara has the ability to just go absolutely crazy uh he has some pretty historically good performances against the packers so i am actually going to favor uh, the google team names in a bit of an upside wow. kind of going against my Going against what I think should happen, I don't know. I just feel like I got to pick an upset this week, and that's the one I'm going with. All right. Well, I am very convinced that Randy's Donuts is going to come away victorious here for a lot of reasons, but I do think something to watch would be how Ayuk does as Noel's wide receiver, too. I know that was kind of a surprise to the league was Noel trusting him to be wide receiver, too. So that'll be something to monitor how many targets he gets, et cetera, against a very vulnerable Lions defense and matchup of the week uh, championship rematch. Uh, it's like they do it on the Thursday night game every year. They try to find the most intriguing matchup possible and they place it there on that prime time. Gluten freaks, screws and grinders last year, obviously as the story goes, Josh Allen's last pass of the season gave uh, commissioner Eichton the win. Um, uh, I mean, a little biased. I like my matchup and I like my, t- my chances with that one. So <laughs> I'm going to go with that. Yeah, I, I'm definitely favoring favoring your team this week, Drew. Um, one of the guys that I specifically have my eye on, and it may sound kind of weird, but it's Mike Evans. You know, I love it. I love it. I Where's don't. Mike? I just hate Dallas, and I just really feel <laughs> like Tampa Bay is just going to curb stop them. And usually, when Tampa Bay destroys a team, Mike Evans is a huge benefactor, and has a couple of touchdowns in like a shit ton of yards. So. I could see Mike Evans going off this week. Um, definitely, definitely, will be paying close attention to uh, Gus Edwards as well on your side to see if uh, that pick, that early pick in the first round, paid off. 
Um, and the guy that I'm watching the most on uh, Zach's team is definitely David Montgomery. I have massive doubts about him this season. Mm-hmm. I think he's a talented player, but I just really don't think he is actually like a solid RB2 like a lot of people feel like he is and like Zach is counting on. So I'll definitely be watching uh, Montgomery very closely to see how he's able to perform. Right, yeah. Uh, that's actually something I'll be looking at too. Just because like clearly I didn't have the – faith in him based on trading him away so um also something to note now Eckler is apparently hurt with a hamstring thing so that'll be something to that Zach might have to take care of yeah that is uh a shame some would say oh that's cold-blooded John that's cold-blooded I love Austin Eckler some would say it's a shame including myself all right let's get into uh this week's fun fact of the week Drew, do you have a fun fact of the week jingle, or are we going to trust Zach to put something in there? I think he's doing it right now. This is the jingle, us talking and trying to make up one. I think you should make a jingle. No, no. I want, well, yours is the go-to that's been on the, on the program. Yeah, well, all right, fine. This week's fun fact of the week, it has to do with the league rankings going into this season. Uh, maybe surprisingly, maybe not the top four teams that were ranked one, two, three, and four, not in order, but just the top four teams ranking wise last season of Noel, myself, Drew, and Josh are also the four highest ranked teams going into this season. So seems like, uh, these teams are staying nice and steady up at the mm-hmm. top, some real powers, real forces amongst, uh, this so we'll be able we'll uh, we'll see if those teams actually stick near the top for the entire season. I know last year, obviously Noel fell all the way to ninth with all of his injuries, and Josh didn't exactly have the best season, probably you know by his standards or anybody's standards. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if all four teams can actually stay up near the top of the rankings going throughout the season as they are currently ranked uh, going into Week One. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, um, it's kind of surprising, uh, but also it's sort of not because that's the way kind of a keeper slash dynasty league is. This is kind of like as dynasty of a keeper league as it gets, you know, if you know what I'm saying. So um, in a way, you know, if you can get those star players, keep them for um, that long, you can see how it makes sense. Uh, But I think it also does kind of go to show that, you know, the the drafting does matter. And um, the fact that Noel, Noel's draft um, and the way his keepers worked out uh, that does kind of show, Hey, his injury luck sucked last year. He's able to come back and suddenly be a, a team to fear once again this year. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, I would, uh, that was my top four as well. I also think it shows the disrespect for defending champion uh, gluten freaks, t- t- uh, Zach Eichton. So uh, I wonder yeah. how he'll respond to that. We'll have to get a statement from, team owner after winning the title last year and blatant. having just no nobody fears him at all blatant uh, disrespect um some might say that many team league owners still think that his team name should be the group the gluten frauds after finishing yeah. one last season when he in the regular season i think finished fifth or sixth so just goes to show you that a little bit of luck in the playoffs and you can come home with a championship mm-hmm. but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be near the top of the rankings going into next season. So I'm yeah. sure Zach, uh, I'm sure you're right. Zach has probably taken that very personally and will probably come out with vengeance in the first. Yeah. He, uh, he should be going to his team now and, uh, you know, making sure that they see this It's a bulletin board material. Uh, if I'm him, I'm going to the team. I'm telling DeAndre Hopkins, I'm telling Josh Allen, I'm telling Austin Eckler and Dave Montgomery, like, Hey, nobody believes in us. Yeah, um, you know, given that motivational speech, uh, if he's a good team owner, team manager, that's the next step for gluten freaks. Otherwise they will soon become the gluten frauds. Yeah. I'm trying to draw a comparison to an NFL team that was disrespected so much after winning a championship. And I, I really can't think of a team that would fit that build. It seems like, yeah, at least in the NFL, the team mm-hmm. that finishes at the top is routinely, at least in like the top oh, yeah. two or three teams, mm-hmm. uh, at least going into the year. Obviously, fantasy is a little bit of a different game, especially in our league setup, only getting to keep five guys, not having the entire same roster as you did last year. So best of luck in week one, Zach. I hope you uh, prove the haters, including myself, wrong. 
Well, I think is that does that conclude the episode of the rat hole? I think it does. It sure um, does. We'll see if uh, so, Zach actually stitches this together at the end, or maybe we're saying maybe it's just all one audio remarks. clip. Yeah, we're just we'll giving see. our closing remarks when this is going to be like in the middle of the episode. Who knows? <laughs> maybe it is. Uh, so I guess thanks for listening. Maybe to the rat hole. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, we'll... turn it off, or maybe don't turn it off. Uh, also, <laughs> secret message, uh, Brennan. If you text me. Uh, fluffy pineapple by uh 6 p.m on thursday so tomorrow i will venmo you five dollars best of luck